Beginning with transformations in relations of production, material relations of production. Man. Yes, young man. I see your hand raised again. Um, it, it seems though, right, the spontaneity shows, uh, I, I mean, I'm trying to find the least offensive way to say this, but I think I'm just going to say it. This, this faith in spontaneity shows an extreme naivety. And the reason why it shows an extreme naivety is, yes, a wildcat strike, um, it, because it doesn't pause it enough. It doesn't theorize enough. Uh, someone could have a wildcat strike for any number of, of various important, theor and I, I think they are important theoretical reasons. Having too long of a workday is a progressive reason to strike. Um, because you're being integrated with blacks, and again, the labor unions, um, especially the AFL, under uh, Gompers, incredibly racist. And so you would have workers striking spontaneously or you know, through uh, you know, loose organizations um, for incredibly reactionary reasons. I mean, why, why, why this emphasis on spontaneity? Yeah, a, a worker uprising is spontaneous, but so is a lynching. And I mean, mm -hmm. so, so where's, 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 the, where's the inherent value of this? Or, or is this just another way of saying the workers do things? Well, I mean, I guess uh, um, autonomous theory uh, would say, okay, well, you accuse us of naivete. I'm going to accuse you of a different kind of naivete. Mm -hmm. uh, people uh, spontaneously organizing, yeah, yeah, are capable of doing bad things. True. <clears throat> but um, if you think that truly transformative, positive, beneficial transformations have taken place uh, via, via any motor other than spontaneous organization of living, breathing, working people, you are naive. You are naive. If you think that Lenin did anything other than arrive in a victorious working class uprising that had overthrown a government and then declared victory, for the Bolsheviks, then you don't know very much about history. So again, uh, the notion, the, the, the central notion is, is that um, historically and contemporarily, real transformation takes place not at the whims of people in position of powers and uh, power and authority, whether they're fat cat capitalists or or party apparatchiks, it always takes place through the organization, spontaneous organization and struggle of ordinary people. Um, but I, I mean, in this case, yeah, absolutely. The, the uprising was completely worker driven. He, he showed up absolutely just late and through political maneuvering, declared it a Bolshevik victory and attempted to seize power twice, uh, July days, and then again in the October Revolution. Um, but there's, there's nothing spontaneous about the Leninist vanguard. There's nothing spontaneous about um, uh, the Soviet Union. There's nothing spontaneous about the Red Army. But also, Lenin, right, who showed up and declared victory, managed to secure the revolution that was initially just an uprising, whereas the spontaneous Spartacists in Germany um, were dumped in a, uh, shot and dumped in a river. And it seems like the only successful institutionalization of any revolutionary gains, and perhaps this is naive of me, but I see the Soviet Union as a progressive force along with every other single communist state that has ever existed with the exception of Cambodia and North Korea. Um, but those are real gains. And if we're talking about working class people, the working class people made real gains from that. But historically, the only revolutions that have been able to institutionalize any working class gains have been, at least in this century, have been Marxist-Leninists of some variety. I might be missing some, but I mean the major ones. Um, so I mean, why, why then, if we're talking so much about context and material conditions, why then would one not look to the historical conditions that were victorious, even under different soils? Well, look, it's not, um, it's not that autonomous Marxism just eschews entirely 
the, the central question uh, of organization, right, which includes, of course, political organization, this, the organization of state institutions and apparatuses. Of course, of course, that is part of, that, that is one of the issues that it has to deal with. Um, and again, uh, uh, given different historical contexts, particular models um, were appropriate. Like, for example, uh, the sort of organization that took place once again in, in the nascent Soviet Union, and particularly in the first few years after the revolution, the, the October Revolution, uh, were, made sense and, and, and were appropriate for uh, those conditions. Um, the autonomous is going to say, well, you know, the, the, the best way of conceiving of issues of organization and how we're going to consolidate and the sort of institutions and apparatuses that we're going to associate with a truly transformative um, a transition uh, is not by, again, understanding a particular theory correctly, whether it's Leninism or whether it's any other theory, and then saying a correct understanding of that theory is going to solve all of our problems. The way that these problems are going to be solved, you know, the hard problems of organization and consolidation and uh, in the structure of institutions is practically, practically, <laughs> that's going to be part of the transformation. And it's going to take place via actual living, breathing people, not consulting the holy text, right? But examining the, 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 the socio-historical context and figuring out what do we need, what will work. What is the best way of organizing politically, state institutions, et cetera? Does that make sense? Just follow up real quick. Um, but I mean, what, what serious, I, I mean, to, to be one of those holy writ kind of people, if you look at Lenin, he specifically says, all theory is ultimately connected to practice, and all practice generates new theore theoretical developments. Yeah. That's so, just Marx. Well, I mean, yeah, it's, marks. well, okay, fair enough. But then where, whither are these Leninists who are just, you know, saying, well, I mean, maybe, maybe there are some, but then doesn't that, if they're holding to Lenin in this way, aren't they just bad Leninists in the same way that people who dumpster dive their way to revolution are bad autonomists? Wait, I'm not sure I understand the question. Well, I, I mean, here's the thing. Autonomous Marxism gets taken up in America through several different strains. One of which is called lifestyleism, where you dumpster dive and you squat and you, you, you do no work. And, right. and you just live off garbage. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so, I, I, I don't know, it, would that be falling within what you see as the most helpful and best model of autonomy or uh, autonomous Marxism? Well, that's, yeah, that's, uh, yeah, in the American context, yeah, it's difficult to understand what exactly the theoretical underpinnings, if there are any of, of that. You could argue that maybe some of these people have been reading uh, Mario Tronti and Sergio Bologna. I don't know. Some of them maybe learned something about uh, Johnson Forest tendency and uh, a movement that was associated with it beginning in the 1950s, zero work probably heard of zero work, right? And the goal of zero work was to end work, <laughs> to end wage labor, right? To, get, to achieve a situation where people didn't have to get a job. So, uh, yeah, I'm not, I guess I don't understand what the stakes of your question are. Uh, the stakes of my question are this. Anyone can more or less declare themselves anything. So if, right, the characterization of the Marxist-Leninist is, right, the nose-in-the-book theorist who doesn't want to do anything and just thinks if we get a right theory, then everything will fall into play, seems to be basically a bad Marxist-Leninist, just like someone who lives off garbage and thinks that that's going to overthrow capitalism would be a bad autonomous. I mean... In this sense, I mean, this is a thing, right? Uh, there's an article on Lipcom where it's talking about negative nominalist Marxism. One of the major claims it says is the workers following their innate desires carve out a space of autonomy for themselves and capital. And th I mean, here's the thing. I, I did it for two, three years, lifestyle anarchism. It's like, hey, we can shoplift and dumpster dive and we'll never have to work ever again and everybody can just do this and once everybody does this, no more capitalism. 